Hello, guys. Welcome back to the Creep It 100 podcast. I am your host, Kinson. I am here with Mark and Jeanette. Say hello, guys. Hi. Hello, hello. All right. So today we are back at you with another true crime part or two part series. Uh, this one we're switching it up a little bit. I was a little tired of how dark the last ones were getting, so we keeping it, you know, still in that same creep it 100 style of scary, but we're gonna tone it down a little bit. This one's a little more lighthearted for you guys. Today we're gonna talk about the Jordan Brown case. This case is a somewhat still unsolved murder case that involved the conviction and arrest of an 11 year old boy for the murder of his stepmother and eight and a half month pregnant stepmother. So Jeanette and Mark have no idea what this episode is going to be about. So I am super, super excited to lay all this on them. I did not let them know any of my research because I wanted to surprise them for you. So today we're going into that. This is a story that's going to take place in somewhere called Wampum, Pennsylvania. And before we get started, I want to hear just what you guys are expecting out of this real quick. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit about the characters involved in this, this story. Uh, and then we can go right in. Okay, guys. What are we thinking so far? I don't know. Um, <laughs> mm, with that description, you um, that tiny description you gave us, mm-hmm. I imagine that the uh, 11, you said he was 11? 11 years old at the time of conviction, yes. I imagine that he was framed. I, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> we live in a fucked up world. Like, it could go either way. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Jeanette, what are we thinking? Well, he was, like how Mark said, framed, maybe, but this could be like a Michael Myers thing. (laughs) What? How so? The kid could probably, (laughs) hey, like he could probably have like some weird thoughts, like this child, this 11 year old child, he could probably have like some weird ass thoughts, you know? Okay, okay, like speaking like how Michael Myers got his his, his sister at the super young age. Yeah, Okay, that makes more sense. So maybe, yeah. Okay, that's not at all what I was thinking. I was like, what the hell are you talking <laughs> Like, dude's probably mental or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, in this case, obviously, Jordan Brown is the center of this case. He is the child, right? His father is Chris Brown. And <laughs> I know, I know, I know. I, I'm, I, I, I wrote it down, and I was like, should I make a joke, or should we not make a joke about Chris Brown being the father? Oh, um, mm. I woke up Chris Breezy. <laughs> yeah. So his yeah. dad is Chris Breezy. Got it. Is, yeah. C Breezy is his dad. And so, and then the stepmom, the uh, victim in this story is Kenzie Hoke. Okay. So Kenzie also has two daughters from a separate uh, relationship that she used to be in. Seven-year-old Janessa and four-year-old Adeline. Seven-year-old Janessa is going to be one of the bigger factors in the story here. But four-year-old Adeline does take a very uh, important role and turns out a very important role as recently as 2018. Like I said, this is still an ongoing investigation. This is still the case. And I'll tell you a little more about that because I don't want to say anything now because it's going to spoil a little bit. Um, And then, unfortunately, like I did say that there is a baby involved. She, Kenzie the mother was eight and a half months pregnant during the time of the murder. So there was a baby inside of her and that baby was named Christopher. Just for context, uh, that's not going to really be mentioned a ton, but just wanted to get that out of the way. So let me tell you guys about what happened here and how this all came about. So Chris Brown had known Kenzie since they were teenagers they were kind of like those hit and miss relationship, like lovers. They always liked each other at the wrong time. And, you know, Kenzie obviously got into this other relationship where she had her two children with another person. Um, I, actually, I, it's, it's suspected two other people. They're, they have separate fathers. And, you know, Chris had another relationship where he had his son, Jordan. And then eventually, you know, timing just lined up and, and they were able to be together. And this is when Jordan was, I believe, eight, 
at this time when they came together full time. And Jordan always loved Kenzie. I, I mean, it got to the point where before, up until this time, Jordan was calling Kenzie mom. It was a very, very tight relationship. He got along with the sisters, with his new stepsisters, Janessa and Adeline, very well. Which brings us to February of 2009. I believe it was February 20th, where an eight and a half month pregnant Kenzie is in bed downstairs in their home that they all share together. Chris wakes up to go to his job at the uh, factory that he works at. And for some reason, one of the only times she's ever done this, Kenzie turns around to him and, and wants him to stay home. Uh, for some reason, she just feels like having an off day. She's going to call off work and wants him to, too. And they just want to have like a family day. Uh, Chris said that this was kind of odd behavior for her, but not too crazy. So he he doesn't do it, though. He, he needs the money. He goes to work. And then we get to about 8.15. This is hours after Chris has already left, uh, probably a few hours. And we're at 8.15, and Jordan and Janessa, the two oldest, get on the same school bus because their grade levels are close enough to where they go to school together. They get on the school bus, and they go. Uh, one thing I do want to keep in mind is that when the baby was coming – that they were about to have, Jordan and the parents, Chris and Kenzie, were going to switch rooms, right? So Jordan's clothes were already in the process of being in the parents' room. So he was in the room while Kenzie was asleep and changing, getting ready for school. Adeline stays home because she catches a much later bus. I mean, she's only four at the time, so she's, you know, she's far below them. Around 9 o'clock, 9 a.m., there are tree trimmers that are coming to arrive on the property, and they are going to you know, trim up a few of the properties, make it look good. They're, they're currently in the, in the process of renovating this whole area and kind of building this house into their dream home. So at 9 a.m., these tree trimmers get there, and one of them looks at the door and sees Adeline, the four-year-old, crying in the doorway, like hysterically, like through the glass door. He goes up and, and she he, he goes, what's wrong? What's going on? He thinks that she might be abandoned or something. And she just keeps screaming, my mom is dead. My mom is dead. They freak out. He calls 911. They go into the room and Kenzie is found with a shotgun blast to the back of her head, still in bed in the same place she was when everybody left that morning. Whoa. He said lighthearted, bro. This is the most. <laughs> That's exactly this what is, I was this is the worst part of the entire thing. Oh my god! Nothing about that fucking light. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, but it's spoiler. It's only one killing this time. <laughs> this is the only killing. Oh, thank God! It was just just one life. Yeah, just just one life, bro. Well, two, I guess. Two. Just for the baby. The, the baby. Oh, oh, yeah. She was eight and a half months pregnant. I mean, like, that's a baby, like, ready to pop, man. Yeah, that's a... That's a... <laughs> that's a, Like, if, if that thing was born at that day, it would be alive. That thing? Uh, well, I, yeah, it was, a, it was a boy. So so if that boy was born <laughs> that day... <laughs> Are we allowed to say that? Jeez. What? Never mind. Let's just move what, on. The, the that thing comment, or that it, that it was born a person. Both. That whole. Yeah, hundred percent. Hundred percent. All right, great. The only mean comments you're gonna get are from sensitive people. It's not that big a deal. We're good. I don't think anybody would argue that a that an eight and a half <laughs> month baby is a baby. You know what I mean? So I think we're. I think we're right there. I mean, even if nothing was born, it, there's 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 special clothes for babies that are born within that era. I mean, that's like the preemie era is like a half month, you know, soon things like that. Right. So, right. yeah. So um, as long as that baby's paying bills, true. Which actually, oh, it true. is true. It does become prevalent later in the case that this is two lives that were taken. Seriously, just just yes, just just keep that in mind. Like mm. without saying too much, that is an important detail that becomes relevant very. Uh, a lot later. So, Mind blown. I mean, well, 
Bad choice uh, of words. Jeanette. <laughs> 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 no fucking way you just said that. <laughs> oh my god. I don't know. I think we should take that one. No, 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 no. no. Fuck that. That, that one is staying in. That's hilarious, bro. <laughs> oh my god. Jesus. Let's just hope. Let's just hope Chris or Jordan don't ever watch this. Ugh. Who? Both of them are very much a, I'm the, the one dad getting... and the son. <laughs> no, who asked? Oh. Oh, oh my god. <laughs> shade. So this is called the shade room, not creepy. Yeah, 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 we're not allowed yeah, to call people out anymore. Welcome we gotta move to the on, move room. on. Yeah, we're, yeah, see, we're so mean to each other now because we're not allowed to call anybody else out. We have to call each other out. <laughs> All our aggression has to be taken out on each other. Like yesterday, or, or, or last episode when... Oh, I forget what I said. I said some dumb mean about Mark though last episode. <laughs> yeah, I remember. All right. I can't. I, can't. I, I, probably oh, I called him one of the out. tall whites. That's what. Oh it yeah, was. you did. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so reeling it back in here, um, taking the tone back down, as because we did such a good job of uh, you know getting ourselves out of that. So let me uh, ruin that. So Kenzie's found, and Chris is obviously called home from his job. And Chris is interviewed as a suspect, but he is very quickly let go. Um, one of the main reasons that he's let go is that in the time allotted between when she was presumed dead and when he left the house, it would have been almost impossible for him to have done a few things. Number one is get all the evidence off of his own clothes, as as in any bodily fluids, anything like that that could have, you know, projected back at him. And there's zero gunshot residue on him, on his hands, on his person, or on his clothes. So this quickly eliminates him as a suspect because even if you, you know, do a lot of things, it's not very likely that you would be able to get that off in the time allotted. So quickly after this, they, they take Janessa and Jordan, the two kids, out of school. They both say that it was a very, very normal morning. The only thing out of the ordinary that Jordan says in any of these interviews is that there was a uh, black truck by the garage that he didn't recognize. So it's the only thing really that was suspicious out of the ordinary. Um, but investigators kind of chopped that up to maybe being one of the tree trimmers that couldn't fit in the, you know, the main van. So he drove his own truck, you know, and for a construction worker, a black truck is a very reasonable assumption for one of their vehicles. So they're going through this, you know, horrible time, and um, uh, th there is one thing that I don't understand about this story is immediately after this happens, immediately after the death of Kinsey, Janessa and Adeline, the two children, just uh, just disappear. Like, not literally, but, like, they're gone. It's I don't like know where the they were. I don't know where they go. Janessa is is a little bit of, a, like, a main character throughout this, and, and she's interviewed a lot. However, Adeline's completely gone, the one that found the body, which, granted, she is a four-year-old, so, I mean, it's, it's hard to, you know, uh, get anything concrete, I guess, from a four-year-old. Right, right. However... Janessa, other than popping up for a few interviews and everything, I just don't know where they went. I mean, these kids were, like, loved by Chris. Chris loved these children because he loved Kenzie so much. And these children reminded him of Kenzie. So he always wanted a relationship with them, but I don't think they were allowed to. I think Kenzie's parents took the children, and they're almost gone starting that morning. Later this night, after the death of Kenzie, they're laying in the house and and jordan is laying in chris's arms and, and they're crying and they're just extremely upset and, and somehow finally after such a traumatic experience they drift to sleep and then at 3 30 in the morning the door knocks crazy there's people almost busting into the house at this point 
and they start freaking out. They walk out, they open the door, and the first thing that the police do, they march in and, and they, they push over Chris, the dad, and they push Jordan to the ground and arrest Jordan on the spot. 11-year-old Jordan Brown is arrested and taken to the police station with no explanation to Chris at all. Chris is so freaked out that he, he follows the cops' cars because he's like, where are you taking my child? You know? And they end up at the police station where uh, Chris eventually sees Jordan in, like, the jail area. And since he's 11 years old, they have to get him the smallest jumpsuit they had, which is a small. And they said that it was rolled about 15 times up his sleeves just to get to his wrists. And, like, the whole thing's super baggy, and he's sitting there in cuffs and the, the cuffs to go across her feet, too. And they say that he's so small that he's sitting there on the chair in the interviewing area, and his feet are just swinging back and forth. Because he can't even touch the ground with his feet at this point. Hmm. Guilty. Guilt? <laughs> That's a crazy analysis to have. So what happened to Philip? <laughs> uh-uh. Uh-uh. No. Uh... Jeanette, don't say a word. Don't respond to this man. Smith's <laughs> trying, trying to ruin the, the podcast. Oh my goodness. Jesus. So, uh, we are currently at the jail, and they've arrested Jordan, and, and they're, they're just not telling Chris what's going on. He's pleading with everybody that he can there, and, and they just basically keep looking at him and saying and saying your your son is a murderer and we've arrested him for murder he's the one that killed Kenzie and How? one thing I t- go ahead. why why did why do they think that yeah I'm about to get into it I got you I got you with all types of reasons Ooh. and then what happened to Candace he's got all the receipts no. you guys don't worry <laughs> no I'm not doing this, bro. I can't have I can't have a recording that exists forever of you getting me with one of these <laughs> jokes, bro. I'm gonna be too careful, okay? Yeah. Okay. If I if this happens, if that happens live on camera, I'm cutting it out. I'm personally, <laughs> I'm personally going to get rid of that episode. I'm gonna go over to your house. I know your schedule. I'm gonna go over to your house while you're gone, and I'm gonna delete the episode. That's not how it works. It's not on says my computer. You, says you, bro. I, okay, bet. Fucking do it. You won't fucking I'll find f- it. <laughs> bro, I promise you I'll hack the iCloud. I can't let that happen to me. I can't even get into the fucking cloud. I can't let that happen to me, bro. I'm just I'm just built different, bro. I'll, I'll get it done. <laughs> I promise you I can't allow that. Bro, you'd have to fucking chase me to the West Indies, bro. The West Indies? Indies nuts. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> yes. I did it! I got him. He really dragged it out to get to that joke. Good job, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Good thank job. You. Good job. Thank you, Jeanette. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's it. I'm sorry, dude. That was that was a good one. What is Indy? Moving on. Now sounds like a great time to go to a break. After this break, I will be smacking the shit out of Mark, and then we will be getting continuing with Jordan's case against him. <laughs> Thank you. Hey everyone, this is Kinson from the Creep It 100 podcast. Today I'm here to talk to you about Skillshare. Skillshare is a platform where you can explore thousands of hands-on creative classes to better yourself in any area. These areas include TV, film, animation, creative writing, music, design, illustration, photography, anything you could think of. Whether you're here to just learn a new skill or learn how to start a small business, they have classes for everyone on Skillshare. Exclusive for our listeners, guys, you can go on and you save 50% when you sign up for an annual plan. 
make sure to click the link in our description below to sign up for your free trial and join Skillshare today. It really is one of the best places to learn any new skill, and I promise you guys will not regret it. Sign up for Skillshare today. All right, guys, we are back from our break. I have recovered from that horrible joke that Mark got me with, and um, I'm feeling good again, guys. I'm feeling good, you know? My energy was low after that. I was feeling discouraged, but we're feeling good. We're back. <laughs> Mark and Jeanette are back with me, even though I wish Mark wasn't, and, you know, it's going to be a good rest of the episode, guys, uh, if Mark doesn't do that again. So... Where we left off was the arrest of Jordan, and uh, they took him to the police station, and they were telling Chris anything. So I'm going to get into a little bit of the reasons why Jordan was arrested and why they thought that they had the means for conviction and an arrest in the first place. So Janessa, who is the seven-year-old of Kenzie, she, in an interview directly after, um, I guess this was part of the interviews we talked about earlier, where... They said nothing was out of the ordinary except for the black truck. Janessa was in another interview directly after that, and she stated that she heard a very, very loud boom in the morning, uh, which she identified to be the gunshot. Um, so they made this they, – they felt to make this arrest as quick as they possibly could, they needed not a ton of evidence because they could always, you know – Grab someone and let them go, which happens a lot in different cases. So they only arrested Jordan 18 hours from the moment of the murder, which is extremely quick. That is a lot. That is so uncareful. There's a lot of time needed for investigations, especially in a homicide. In this case, double homicide because of the child. And they just they, – they, they did it so quick. They did it within 18 hours, which – I don't know. Just to me, sounds that feels way sloppy too almost. It it does. It, it feels like there was a lot of room for error when it's done that quickly. Mm. They just they they felt, in my opinion, someone said the idea. Maybe it was Jordan, and they collected evidence with that in mind. It almost felt, which is a very very dangerous way to do police work. You have to do police work knowing that there is any outcome or you are going to shape a story the way you want it to be shaped, especially when you are the ones in control of the investigation. So Kinson and I solved a murder like two weeks ago. Uh, that's true. We did. Throw that out there. And we didn't even get a story about it. It kind of sucked. Whatever. So if you see us on 10 TV. It's local to us. Nobody else. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, follow so, us on uh, follow me and Kinson's uh, crime fighting handles um, <laughs> at at Mystery Incorporated Ohio. That's where you can find us. <laughs> true, true. Yeah, yeah. We do a lot of fun stuff over there, man. We say a lot of oh rats. Uh, oh rats. Um, gosh we get a lot of meddling kids. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sometimes we we got lucky and we traveled to Kenya. No, no. <laughs> We can't do this again. I'm not going to let you do it to Jeanette either. <laughs> I'm trying to protect her more than I'm myself. Just, I'm just trying to cope with the conversation. I'm like, all right, I'm just going to listen. Yeah. So after investigators searched the house, um, they ended up finding a ton of guns, which keep in mind, this is in Pennsylvania. This is a tiny bit more Southern. This is very realistic for any southern house to have a lot of guns and especially in that type of community it is very very uh reasonable and probable that kids especially young males will be brought up shooting guns and hunting and doing all those activities it is not even kind of weird that there was a lot of guns in there they also did find a child-sized shotgun which doesn't bode well for jordan However, like I said, it's just not unusual for a community in this area. They did uh, open up the small shotgun, though, and they said that it smells as if it had been shot recently. 
I will say that again, and you tell me if this seems like a good piece of evidence. They looked at the shotgun, sniffed it, and said, kind of smells like it was shot recently. That is one of the main pieces of evidence for this entire investigation was the smell of the shotgun. Mm. One of the other reasons that... Yeah, go ahead. No, 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 no. I was just, like, kind of thinking about it. Like, it's, mm-hmm. hmm. it's, it's weak. It's a weak point, to say the least. You know, that tacked on to a bunch of other evidence, physical evidence and, and things like that might be reasonable, but that as a main evidence piece is just not it's Yeah, not that being, like the, like, the lead piece of evidence is... It's what, yeah, it's, it's not, one of the main piece of evidence. Not very concrete. Like, no. that's... I've never seen or heard of a mystery murder where they're like, yeah, we sniffed the gun and it smells like it was shot recently. Like, I don't... That's odd. But, all right. So one of the other main reasons that they uh, suspected Jordan was that the same way that they did a second interview with Janessa, they did a second interview with Jordan. And... Jordan's interview started changing. His story about the morning started changing. Um, The description of that black truck changed. He started noticing more things about it, uh, including that he said that it still had snow on it. And I want you to listen to that key piece of evidence, because that's going to be important a little bit later. He said that there was still snow on this black truck. And that now there was a man inside that like appeared to be like ducking, like like he might have seen Jordan. He didn't want Jordan to see him. Um, to investigators, this was a big red flag, and were like, ah, his his story changed, so he must be lying, and he's like now covering with more details. To me, honestly, sounds like an eleven year old kid who this person that he calls mom is now dead, freaking the fuck out. Wait, so it wasn't one of the gardeners. Who? The black truck. We don't know. We don't so know. My yet. man just could have been sitting there, play, like he planting tulips, bro. Could have been a random guy. I, well, the the thing is, is is that the truck was next to the garage, so whoever was there was not a stranger. It was someone that was meaning to be on the property. So, wait, what were they? Landscapers? What were they? The tree trimmers at the beginning. Tree trimmers. So they weren't yes. planting tulips. <laughs> anyway <laughs> moving on so now we have a different description of this truck and we uh we go back to interviews with janessa so janessa then says in another interview that she sees jordan moving his guns that morning moving them around the house and prosecution once they once they take or once they took Jordan from school and they brought him in they actually tested every single person that was in that household for gunshot residue and there was gunshot residue on Jordan's hands this is somewhat explained away and difficult to test because Jordan was 100% completely proven on a duck hunt the day before. That residue, it's a kid, man. Kids don't wash their hands very nice. It would have stayed. So it's very possible that that residue was from there. It was faint, so it was there. And after this gunshot residue, they started looking around for different evidence of the of a gun and things that happened. They, they, they were never able to identify that that child sized shotgun was the actual murder weapon. It's just all basically up to assumption. You said child's child size, uh, shotgun. What? Shotgun. Yes. Which was among the many guns that they found at the residence. That's the one like that they, said, uh, sock gun.
Oh yeah, did it? (laughs) (laughs) (sighs) Oh, good lord. This is the most careful episode I've ever done in my life. Stay on edge, boy. I've got plenty more in the chamber. This probably wasn't the right thing to say on this podcast. I'm sorry. You got what, bro? (laughs) Huh? Plenty more in the chamber? Plenty more. It's mind-blowing. So, yeah, mind-blowing. So on the property... That caught me the fuck off guard. (laughs) That was funny as hell. So on the property, they ended up finding three shotgun shells, all, um, all the most recent shotgun shells that they could find. You know, uh, what this, year was this? What year did all this take place? Two thousand nine. So this was the, like, this is February twentieth through like the end of February of two thousand nine. Okay. And Jordan is eleven at this time. Okay. So they find shotgun shells around the property. Three shells particularly are the newest shells that they could find. Again, not unfamiliar. They're doing shotgun practice, whatever. Just shooting guns. You know, that's just that's just how things were around that community. Not crazy. However, one in particular that they pointed to and grabbed was a one that was directly next to the driveway. In the exact route that Jordan would have gone to the bus. The reason that they say this, or the reason that they uh, kind of held on to this, was in one of the interviews, Jordan is accounted with saying that he, for some reason, he mentioned that while he was running to the bus, he pulled lint out of his pocket and threw it on the side of the driveway. I don't. That's such a weird thing to say, but right where he says he did this is the freshest of the shotgun shells that they found. And during this, it it gets to this point where they start, you know, showing this evidence. And Chris is, Chris is honestly unsure. He, He admits in an interview that he didn't know if his son was innocent. He thought he was innocent at first. He heard of this evidence and he really had to like to think about it and say, am I, is my son a murderer? Or like, I, I might actually have to face this fact. And he goes on to say later that throughout the arrest and throughout the trials and everything like that, he gives him many, many opportunities where I believe what he says is, he says, Jordan, I'm, I'm always going to be your dad. I understand accidents happen. I understand that you cannot be in the right frame of mind sometimes. Did you do this? I'm always going to be your dad and I'm always going to love you. So tell me now. And Jordan never, ever, ever went away from his story. He always maintained his innocence. And Chris was basically, he was certain of his innocence after he talked to him. He said that as an 11-year-old boy and as the father of this boy, you know, you can, you ask a kid something, you can tell when they're lying, if that's your kid. And he said, I, it was no doubt in my mind that he was innocent after talking with him about like the fourth or fifth time. So he gets put in a detention center, a juvenile detention center, which is four hours away from Chris and the family home. And Chris starts to drive every single day, four hours to the jail to see him. Eventually he loses his job over this. He's spending every dime he has on money to put in the gas tank to get to him every day and he's just trying to figure out a way to get him out and like i said jordan the only reason he's doing this is because jordan never wavers from his opinion he never thinks that he 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 never even reveals it might be an accident you know he, he always maintains that i didn't do this it was not me that was like my mom this isn't me finally we get to about two years after the actual arrest Jordan has been sitting in this detention center for juveniles for two straight years before he's even decided if they are going to try him as an adult or a juvenile because they want to trial him as an adult because he did, quote, an adult crime deserves an adult trial. However, 
He's 11 years old. So what it was, what was said by a few prosecutors was basically there is no in-between on this. He's either going to be in jail for the rest of his life or he's going to be back in time to learn how to drive. And there's going to be about no in-between. So here we are two years later after the arrest and the judge finally starts to give his opinion on all of this. And the actual judge proceedings take another entire year. And they decide to try him as an adult. It's pretty good. Scratch that entire line. They decide to try him as an adult. However, a month later, it is immediately overturned. It goes up a level, and it is now decided to try it not as an adult. He is going to be tried as a juvenile because the prosecution came back with a few more pieces of evidence, and it was overturned. So Jordan goes to trial for his official, did he do it, did he not, at 14 years old. This is three years after his arrest. He has been sitting in jail without them knowing if he actually committed this crime for three whole years. He's now 14 years old. Jordan is found guilty of double double homicide and immediately put in jail and immediately locked away. Was that their only reason, though? Because they found the residue on him and... Those were pretty much the biggest points. That's it? Yeah. Nah. Okay, look, I feel like there's something fishy going on with the ones investigating it. Like, why mm-hmm. is that the only, like, evidence that you need? Uh, like, cause... Yeah, also, why were they so, why were they so, like, for arresting Jordan? And so quickly, I think, too. Yeah, yeah quickly I, as fuck. I, I think, like I said, is um, someone projected the idea that it might be Jordan, so they collected all evidence in favor of Jordan being the assailant and that's just unfortunately what happened so every piece of evidence they found they only thought it was prevalent if it proved jordan's guilty or or jordan's guilt further Hmm. see i'm not an expert but i feel (laughs) like in every single one of these cases they should definitely like not like, oh, should we do? No, like they should do and put a law on light detector tests. Like they should, like 100%. Because, hmm, seems a little fishy with the ones investigating it. Lie detector tests actually are not able to be used as evidence for or against any assailant in, in, a, in a criminal criminal court because they are, are, are unreliable. So... Here we are, guilty, double homicide, Jordan is sent away. It's not looking very good. Chris is still going crazy trying to prove his son's innocent. The state is happy. Uh, Supreme Court is starting to hear about this case. I, I, when this case broke and when it went to trial, it was, it was everywhere. I mean, the mugshot of this 11-year-old kid went everywhere. It was instantly a viral sensation because of how absolutely ridiculous it was. And there was tons of people protesting for Jordan. There was tons of people protesting against Jordan. And in the end, they made it a uh, guilty verdict. I think I saw a video on YouTube about this. You might have seen the mugshot. It's hand, It's like it's the mugshot's like super tall. And then his head's just like way at the bottom of it because he's so short. Mm-hmm. It almost looks like he's, a parody. It's yeah, so, like he's, goofy. Yeah, he's like a child, so it's it's way down there. And how tall is he? I think he was like he was like four or five or some shit like that. Like my man was like small. He was eleven. Like that, that mugshot looks like it was an actual goof, an actual like parody of a mugshot. Yeah, it does. Yeah, parody's nuts. Hmm. <laughs> Nah, bro. That's not one. That's not one. No, no. I was, I was hoping you'd say something, but you know what? I went for it. I went for it. Yeah, you went for it. You, got, you tried it. You tried it. You tried it. So I'm still so proud of that West Indies one. 
Yeah, that, <laughs> you can you can have your one for the episode, okay? So right after this arrest, uh, Chris starts going crazy, like I said, and he starts reviewing all these interviews. And in these interviews, he notices there are seven main interviews that they that they take of, of credible sources. In every single interview, all seven. They are asking the classic like things like the, you know they ask for a homicide. Uh, do, you, do you know anyone that could have done this? Is there anyone that wanted to hurt her? Did she have any enemies? And to the, do you think anyone could have hurt her? Every single one of the seven people all said the same name, and that name was Adam Harvey, her ex boyfriend who has a restraining order against him from her and drives a black truck. And that is where we are going to pick up on next week's episode of Jordan Fuck. Brown Part 2. Bro. <laughs> are you for real? Yep. <laughs> Gotta keep you guys wanting more, bro. This is unfair, dude. I know. I'm getting these cliffhangers, bro. <laughs> all right guys well thank you guys so much for listening to part one of jordan brown and thank you so much for listening to the creep 100 podcast as always you can go ahead and see all of our socials uh they're gonna be at creep it 100 pod and you can go down in the description you can support us by supporting any of our sponsors along with our donation system and subscription system where you can subscribe to us or just help those sponsors Support us by supporting them. This is Kinson, Mark, Jeanette. Say goodbye, guys. Bye. Bye. We're heading All right. Out. We are signing off, guys. <laughs>